Hello and welcome to Horror Court Trash Over, the show that discusses all of the masterpieces and trash the pieces of genre cinema. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. And we've reached that time of year again. It's always one of my favourites to record. It's our end of year episode. Yeah, the end of 2022. It's gone so fast. It has. I'm saying this like we haven't got another episode left. But yes, it's usually the end of year episode. And we'll count it as the end of year well, episode. Technically, we are discussing we are. The, the year yeah, as a whole. We're summarising the year. Yes. What a year. For films, yes. For films, <laughs> this... I, I'm going to go on record saying this. Out of my 30 years of being alive, this might be the best year for films. Yes. Yeah. Like, this has been unbelievable. So, we should probably start the episode by saying, for, uh, for anyone who's listened to our previous end of year episodes, we would usually be doing the 10 best, 10 worst of the year. Um, and I know a lot of you enjoy us bitching about other films, you know, we're called horror called trash, other, you know, like, I get it, I get it. This year, we haven't had enough bad films. No, we haven't. We haven't. So, it is going to be the 20 best horror films of the year, amongst many other honourable mentions and awards. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it honestly gets to the point where... We just haven't got enough to discuss for bad films. We don't want to force it, so... Uh... Yeah, and do you know what? It's 2022. It's been a rough year. You know, we've had 20 Prime Ministers. There's a cost of living crisis. People are having a shitter of a time. Yeah. Let's put some positivity Let's exactly. give you 20 must-see horror films from 2022. That's the idea. That's Let's the get, idea. Some, get some good karma out there, Gary. Yeah. And for all our returning listeners, uh, we would obviously like to start the episode by thanking you all for the support throughout the year, because, I mean, again, you know, we, it, it's crazy. We, we've we gone from being two people at like, oh, shall we start a podcast, releasing one episode on fucking Alien 2, uh, to being here with, like, nearly 8,000 listens and, and all that stuff, you know, just your support every week, it means a lot to us. Yes, thank you very much for listening and not being horrible. Yeah, and, and for those that have stuck around for the whole 231 episodes, oh, thank, God. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I apologise. Um, for anyone catching up, it's okay, you can skip the Crawl Attentions 2 episode. <gasps> uh, and yes, for returning listeners and for new listeners, this episode will be completely spoiler free, so yeah. you don't need to skip anything. No, we'll carry on listening. No, we these we're recommending films. We want you to go out and watch them, so we won't spoil them for you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So before we get to our twenty films, we have our first of two awards rounds. Ooh, because yeah, a lot's changed since the last. We, we've really enjoyed giving out awards. Yeah, since and... since the last best of the year, we uh, we now have a new awards section. So yeah, yeah. Fine. But this is the classic one that we usually give out every year, uh, starting with... Oh my Christmas God! And now you can finally hear what we're going on about with that sound clip, <laughs> because we've been quoting it for two years now, and then you've finally heard it. Yeah, yeah. And that award, of course, goes to the biggest surprise of the year, starting with the horror genre, and for me, it's Terrifier 2. <gasps> Chris hasn't seen it, no, so... Oh um, my Christmas God. Indeed. Oh my Christmas God. Yeah. Terrifier, fucking hated it. Like, I really despise that film. It just, it was just a display of practical effects with no plot uh, and a villain that was completely underused just by putting him in these random, with these random women and just murdering. It's felt a bit misogynistic, let's just say that. Terrifier 2 has a final girl. The effects are still there. Art the Clown is actually utilised as a villain properly this time. And it's just a genuinely good film. Uh, two and a half hours. I don't know how they managed to keep it entertaining for that long, but they did. Uh, and yeah, one thing I never thought I'd be saying, Terrifier 2 is my big surprise, and I'll, I'll actually absolutely be there for Terrifier 3. Yeah, not going to lie, I refused to watch Terrifier 2, because I didn't enjoy Terrifier. Everyone was saying it was two and a half hours. I so said, why would I waste two and a half hours? And you wouldn't be wasting it. No, but you didn't know that. No, I didn't know Hence, that. all my Christmas God. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's one for me in the future when I've got a spare two and a half hours. Because um, everyone's telling me I need to watch it. When the third one comes out, we'll, yeah, we'll do a trilogy. Um, no, we, we would not be watching no. the first one again. <laughs> I don't remember much from Terrifier, good, to good, be good, fair. That way. My... Oh, my Christmas God. Was Smile. Yeah. Smile. Yeah. Um, 
genuinely quite shocked at how good that was. Yeah, really, that could have been mine. I enjoyed it. You yeah. know, it's you know not not groundbreaking masterpiece, but I thought it was going to be shit. Yeah, that trailer did not do it justice. Yeah, also the trailer gave away one of the biggest jump scares, mm-hmm. which annoyed me. But actually, a really decent horror film. Yeah. Enjoyable. It really made time. It, it made it look so basic, that trailer. It really did. I thought, oh my God, I don't want to go see this. And then it was getting good word of mouth. And we were like, oh, I suppose we should watch it. Yeah, I mean, that the opening scene alone, you know, it really, um, it's quite layered. Considering, yeah. you know, I mean, the, the way it delves into mental health and everything. We, we let a film a premise like that, there's a good chance there's going to be shitty mental health representation. But... No, it it's actually really fucking good, and yeah. you know some great um, there's some great metaphors in there for struggles, and yeah, we did a great job. Yeah, it's not part of our top twenty. No, spoiler alert. But um, I would I would say go watch it. Yeah, absolutely. If it's like your kind of thing. If yeah. you listen to this, you've probably already seen it. Yeah, that's true. Next up, it's the Oh my Christmas God Award for biggest surprise of the year, non horror. What's yours? Mine is Top Gun Maverick. Mine is also Top Mine Gun Maverick. Mine is Top Gun Maverick. Yeah. I've not known a sequel to surpass the original by so much in ages. Really. Because no. the, the original Top Gun, I enjoyed it. It was fine. You know, it was a fun time. It was a product of the 80s. You know, so there's that sort of camp value to it. But... Top Gun Maverick. Oh my god, I was on the edge of my seat. This is this is the thing though. I mean, I've never known a film to benefit from being less camp. That's this is the first in my in my book anyway. Yeah. Um but yeah, I mean the, the first one it, it, it really is just fine. It's there's nothing special about it. It's just <clears throat> the, the the most special thing about it is the homoeroticism that, you know, keeps it entertaining. Um, and the soundtrack, of course, but but this just had everything going for it. It was well made, you know. The performances were fantastic, uh, and yeah, it was just really intense. I think it really benefited from the um, filmmaking, yeah, um, aspects. Yeah, definitely. What what am I looking at? Oh, oh over the last how many like almost thirty how, years? How, yeah, with the time that's passed. There's a lot of te- new technology. Development, and... that's the word yeah, I'm looking yeah, for. The te- technological developments over the last 20 odd years really helped. So it kind of, it was able to do what I feel like the original really wanted to do, but couldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, there was real sort of heart to it. There was. It was, yeah. you know, it wasn't just action, action, action. There was layers to it. Yeah. Great performance. Even Tom Cruise, someone who I find very strange i thought he, but i i thought his character was very um sort of interesting yeah you, you know it was it really was a great film and i was obviously surprised because i wasn't expecting a, <laughs> i was expecting a lot of the same as yeah. the original film yeah. and it, it topped it in every way could have been a funny joke though if we were talking about the original. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, there was a little homoeroticism in uh, Maverick as well. Let's be honest. Yeah, they did. They did keep uh, a beach scene in there. They from, did. In the original. They did. Uh, but yeah, Top Gun Maverick is also mine. So moving on to the Garbage award for biggest disappointment of the year, horror. There's a good chance we've got the same. We definitely have the same. It is, of course. Netflix's Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Fucking hell. What a load of shit. Really, just awful. Just, it, it took everything that made the original great and threw it out the window. Okay, but that's fine. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. Because this franchise is never going to go back to the bare minimum. No. It's never going to go back. That doesn't the, sell to a modern audience. No. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, people think it's this brutal, really gory film. There's hardly any blood in it at all. It is atmospheric... And it makes you think you've seen all this gore, you know, because of the perfect cinematography and sound design and performances. You know, the meat hook scene is the best example in cinematic history of, you know, using minimalism to great effect because you think you see it go in. Yeah. But it doesn't. No. You, you don't see it go in, you know? Um, Excuse me. It's, it, yeah, it, the original is one of the greatest films ever made. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. 
the sequels, as they've gone on, you know, they've got gory. And, and that's, I mean, that's partially Toby Hooper's fault. He did it with Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. It worked, you know. If a Texas Chainsaw Massacre sequel is going to go down the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 route, then brilliant. You know, go all out with your gore, make it fucking wild, add the comedy. Great. That's what I want to see. The remake, you know, that's gory. Great film, you know. This just... <sighs> It's lucky it didn't get the basic bitch award. Um, no. But no, it has to be big disappointment because it had potential. Yeah. It had potential. It went down the requel road and then... But the thing is, every sequel has in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. There's never been a sequel to a sequel. No. You know, it's always straight from the original. That, that's fine. But this was bringing back Sally. You know, recast, but it was bringing back Sally. Yeah. It could have been... You know, it could have been Halloween 2018-esque. It could have been a an empowering film of, you know, a woman getting over her struggles for all these years and facing it head on. Fucking insult to Sally. Like, what the fuck did they do with that character here? It, they didn't do much. I mean, this, this is probably where they went wrong, in my opinion. It was Halloween 2018 was Laurie's story. Yeah. And if I had just copied that and did Sally's story, you know, and how she's dealt with what happened to her, you know, and it touches on it slightly. But if they would just copy and pasted what Halloween 2018 did, we would have sat here and said, oh, yeah, that was fine. But that's their problem. They did, but they didn't do it enough. But they didn't. But they But it would have been a better film. But it also yeah. wouldn't have been a great film because there's so much other issues but I, uh, I just thought it was, it wasn't dull. It's just a bit stupid. It was. And the thing is, they even repeated dialogue from Halloween 2018. Yeah. You know, there was a section of the film where they really tried to copy it. But Sally has like 10 minutes of screen time, if that. Yeah. It, it just felt like she's there just because she needed to. Just yeah. so then it could fall into the recall category. Yeah. Or just to get some buzz around the film. Yeah. Let's be honest. What does it matter though when it's not Marilyn Burns? Yeah, you know yeah. it's it's the the uh, the actress who played Mandy and you know in Mandy and she's she's a great actress but this was fucking she wasn't giving much to do here. Um, but yeah, dumb characters, fucking great Leatherface. You know there are some good kills in there. I thought the guy who played Leatherface did a great job. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have much to do. Obviously, he just puts a mask on and kills people. But you know, props to him. He sound like me. Props to him, and uh, the ending got a laugh out of me. But other than that, yeah, that is <laughs> yeah, that, was, that is that uh, was high camp. That, that is our <laughs> biggest horror disappointment of the year. It was. Next up, it's the garbage day biggest disappointment of the year. Non horror. What's yours? It's Nightmare Alley. It's also I my... had such high expectations for Nightmare Alley. Del Toro. Alley. Why wouldn't you? Del Toro, film noir. You know, a great cast. Yeah. Really just, an, a, it should have been five star, tens, tens, tens across the board. Nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. The fuck? <laughs> yeah, surprisingly. I thought it was dull. I thought yeah. it was so dull. The first half had me intrigued um, when they were at the carnival. Okay, this could be going somewhere good, you know. I'm, I'm, in, I'm fully intrigued. And then it just fucking loses it. it if anything, it loses it when it becomes more of a film noir. Uh, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. You know, it's just a complete waste of a great cast. Um, it's just boring. It's, it's genuinely, it there's no boring. other way of I, describing it. It's boring. I wish it would have just been a bit weirder, a bit, you know, when... The only thing I can remember, and this isn't a spoiler, is Tony Collette giving him a handjob in the bath. Well, yeah. That's the only thing I, can, I mean, what, what's it? Kate Blanchett was in it. And I feel like she was serving. She was serving. She was serving, but I don't remember anything about her character. No, because her character was boring. Dull. It was really, really dull. I, I, yeah. I, yeah, I was bored. Yeah. There's and that's the biggest disappointment of all. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's not much more to say about it, really. It's true. <laughs> beautiful gowns. Beautiful, beautiful gowns. Beautiful gowns. Beautiful gowns. The gowns were beautiful. Um, I trashed the piece of the year. There's no competition here. It has to be. The greatest trash to piece made since The Room. Oh. It is, of course, Blackbird. A film that has 
that was released for like two weeks and has completely disappeared off the face of the earth. Of course. <laughs> Out of embarrassment. Michael Flatley, the Riverdance Michael Flatley. He's uh, he, he's made a vanity project yeah. and it is fucking insane. It is Casablanca meets Casino Royale. But shit. shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You almost did it way too much just to say. shit. Um, his wife dies and he he wants that revenge. Um, but it, it, I, I don't want to say too much about it. I don't want to say too much about it, but I will say this. It includes a scene. The film written, directed, produced, and starring Michael Flatley contains a scene where a beautiful woman goes to his hotel room, undresses in front of him, and he's like, no, no, dear, no, dear, no, I can't, I can't do it. And he literally turns her away and shoves her out of his room. Yeah. The film, written, directed, star, and produced by this man, <laughs> he wrote that for himself. Wrote that for that this himself. This woman has broken herself this in, woman, and he can't do it. <laughs> I mean, less than half his age. Well, yeah. more, well more yeah. than half his yeah. age, really. More than half his age. Yeah. He, he shows off his entire hat collection. There's at least 30 years between them. And there's also at least 30 hats in the film. Yes. Um, you've got to see it. This might have to be a milestone. If it ever reappears on the planet and we ever get to see it again, uh, it might have to be a milestone episode for the podcast. It's that special. It's, yeah, it's truly something to be seen. Um, just... And the fact that our cinema screening was like going to a screening of the room. It I was. I think that Everyone was in on the joke. No one went there expecting to see a good Michael Flatley no. film. Everyone knew what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. It's a must watch. How it got a wide release, I don't understand. The trash of the year, which is the worst of the year, you know, just it, just bottom of the barrel shit um, that we advise staying as far away from as possible. Do you have the same as me? I certainly do. Um, it was close. It was almost a cloud so high. Yes. Which I think deserves a mention because any film that ends on the F slur deserves a mention for being absolute dog shit. That, yeah. You know, that film was transphobic. It was homophobic. It was racist. It was misogynistic. It was, it was fucking just absolutely abysmal. And, you know... Big fans of indie cinema here. We always say it. We hate putting down indie films. You know, running our own fucking indie film festival. But, you know, I mean, films like this are the reason we are running our own indie film festival. Because shit like this should not be made in 2022. Yeah. And, and well, it shouldn't be shown, really. No. Let's, let's no. be honest Absolutely. Here. Absolutely. You know, if you're running a festival, you, you've got to watch through these films and make sure that, you know, if any trigger warnings need to be put in place, they're put in place. Uh, and and that if if a film is made by a straight white man and it contains homophobia, transphobia, anything like that, it just don't show it. Don't show it. Throw in a fucking bin. Seriously, it's twenty twenty two. Yeah. Which brings me to the next one. A film that certainly had no trigger warnings at the first four we watched to that. Well, it did. Well, this is what annoyed, and this this is I think a big reason for why gasp is happening is it did kind of had a trigger warning but it was kind of like oh my god this is so you know controversial this is so, so extreme extreme this is so it, it kind of it was almost like a badge of honor yeah rather than an actual trigger warning to say you know this yeah. might be a little too much for people this is yeah. you know your warning <clears throat> to leave it was kind of like oh my god guys Check this out. Yeah. Kind of trigger warning. Um, yeah. And the film we were presented with was Megalomania. Megalomania. We didn't even finish the whole film. No. We got an hour in and there was another hour left and we just left because this was fucking disgusting. It, it was absolutely disgusting. And, you know, we've watched a lot of horror films over the years with some really extreme stuff in it. Um, but... Even some of the stuff from like the 80s and the 70s, you know, where it was a different time and you perhaps could have excused something like this, still didn't feel as misogynistic as this. Because this is a film made by men. Um, and weirdly enough, for the second year in a row at Grimfest, because we, I think we may have had the worst of the year from Grimfest last year as well, mm. um, for similar reasons. It is just a film of women being brutally tortured, sexually assaulted, and just in every way possible it's fucking but it's not 
whereas you have some horror films where, of course, you know, a lot of women die in horror films. A lot yeah. of women are murdered in horror films and whatnot. But it, when you have, like, a slasher film, it's kind of, you know, people are killed in inventive ways. It's very tongue-in-cheek, you know. Uh, it almost becomes comedic to a certain point because of how ridiculous it is. This was so realistic uh, to the point it, it made me feel a bit sick. Like, it, it was brutal, absolutely brutal. But whereas in other horror films you always have a female protagonist to counteract with this, a strong female character that we're rooting for, we want to, you know, kill the villain and survive and move on to the sequel, this didn't even have that. No. It had one character who also went through a lot of the same shit herself, but then she was against the other women. So she was technically, you know, she was going into an antagonist territory. Yeah, I think the biggest problem with, and, and you, you mentioned it there, was that we've seen extreme films, and every film is a product of its time. And when we watch these films we look at it as a product of its time and we use that to understand it not to forgive it mm. but we use it to understand yeah. it and we look at it from that perspective yeah. of what was acceptable and you know after a certain amount of time particularly with a lot of films where everyone involved is dead yeah you look at it as almost a historical document absolutely as an interest yeah. piece rather than entertainment i'm thinking i spit on your grave yeah yeah, yeah. that I'm not entertained by I spit on your grave. No. I'm interested in it, and I'm interested as a product of its time. We're in 2022 now. Yeah. There's no excuse for this kind of film. No. This is, you know, it's not saying anything it's at not. all. No. It's not, you know, it has no layers to it. It has no real plot. No. Really, from what I gathered no. from the first hour, it's just relentless. Mm violence and sexual assault against women yeah for no reason apart from look how you know controversial we can be look how oh, how is this making you feel do you feel bad mm. you know it, it's got no merits as a film at all no. you know it's got no merits as entertainment mm. no merits as a think piece it's 2022 no excuses no. No. That's I'm not saying that this shouldn't be in films, but if you're gonna show it, you need to deal with it. And you need you need to show what that means. What that means to the women, mm -hmm. you know, and what and convey some sort of heart. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It, it's I just <clears throat> it's this bullshit for the sake of it. And I thought we were past that. Yeah, especially in a year where so many horror films... I mean, majority of my top 20 are either produced, written, or directed by women. Yeah. You know? Um, there's there's a lot of female involvement in horror and shit, and it really shows. And I think that's why it was so jarring to us as well. Because it's never been more obvious that a film has been completely made by men. Yeah, to, to be controversial. Yeah. To, but I thought we were past that. Yeah, if, I it feels we like... Past that. This is our films of 2022, yeah. not our films of 1972. Exactly. It, it feels like it was made by someone who hasn't had any luck with women. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, I'll get them back. I'll make this fucking film. But it's it's just a way of being controversial. Yeah. And it's like, how do, you, how do I push this further? Well, we see a lot of violence against women in films. So why don't I up the ante? Mm. It's just, I've never seen it. I have absolutely no wishes to see it whatsoever. But it's it was reminiscent of what I think the Serbian film is. Yeah. Just for the oh, no, sake no. Yeah. of it. Like, the what are idea, you saying? The You're idea of just... dealing with yeah, this. Of pushing something out just to be controversial. Absolutely, that is a good comparison. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think the director of a Serbian film tried to um, put some analogies out there of what it all means, but I mean, it's absolute bullshit. It doesn't mean anything. You're just trying to be controversial. This I, this director didn't even... I mean, we didn't say for the Q&A, obviously, because we left halfway through the film, but yeah. during his introduction, he didn't even try and fucking say a thing. He, he didn't try to say anything about it. No, no. It was... I, I just... I feel for anyone who has seen it without a trigger mm. war and, and really got triggered. Yeah. Cause it, it's and it, again, you know, that's awful. not even completely down to the filmmaker. That's absolutely down to the festival. That yeah. should be put in place. Mm. You, you need to do better. <clears throat> but yeah. 
But if you work for Grunfest and you listen to this, please keep listening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> please support our festival. Or just, um, or just you know. But no, this is feedback. This is feedback. Listen to what we're saying. We love going to Grunfest. We love yeah. going to Fright Fest. You know, we love going to these festivals. But, you know... <laughs> You're There's alienating these... your audience. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Fright Fest have finally got a diversity board now. After how many fucking years? But, you know, you got to realise these things. You're in 2022. Um, but, yeah, just hope we do a great job of gas. It's just, it's <laughs> deflating when you've watched some great films and then you get one just as horrible and harsh as this. Yeah, most of my top 20 is festival films. And then also, you know, something like, I guess, A Cloud So High. A Cloud So High, yeah. It just, it took the air out of the room. Yeah, yeah, no one clapped. No Everyone one claps clapped. After the film. No one claps after that. Because before, you know, one of the Fright Fest hosts come out and he was like, oh yeah, this is, this is one of my favourites of the year. You're going to really love this. But then when no one clapped after the end of the film on an F slur, yeah, it is, uh, it is a film that's going to divide people. No, no, everyone hated it. Everyone hated it. No one liked it. It was a fucking terrible idea that you put it on. Yeah. Absolutely terrible idea. Because it was offensive. Yeah. You know. And the director was so proud of it. Yeah. You've got to think of the pink pound. <laughs> well, yeah. So that brings us <laughs> to another rant. <laughs> oh, the good gracious. Less, less so, I think. <sighs> this I found this pretty offensive. The biggest basic bitch award. <laughs> have you got the same? Of course I have. We both have Jurassic World Dominion. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you bring Laura Dern back? <laughs> Oscar, Emmy, everything winner. Winner of my heart, Laura <clears throat> Dern. How dare you bring her back and give her this material to work with? The, yeah, we How literally have Laura rude. Dern saying the exact dialogue. Oh, yeah, I uh, I slid into Jeff Goldblum's DMs. No, she's better than that. She's better what than that. What the fuck? And even Jeff Goldblum, I love Jeff Goldblum. He's one of my favourite actors. I, I adore him. I watch anything with him, here, with him in. He's great. What the fuck? Yeah. What, what was he here for? What yeah. was he here for? Sam Neill, I love Sam Neill. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> This was just absolutely bizarre. You're going to bring back a legacy cast. You've got to make use of them. They are wasted here. Massively wasted. And the new cast, you know, I enjoyed the first two Jurassic World films. And, you know, not too big on Chris Pratt anymore for obvious reasons. Um, but fucking hell, he, he looked dead behind the eyes in this film. Oh he did not want to be there. Oh my god. He was dug up. Forced to be in this film and then put back to sleep. It was I, I, awful. I find that with everything he's in, that ever since uh, his little revelation about his homophobic church come out, he, everything he's in, he just does not want to be acting anymore. It. Just stop I've casting him. Stop never, casting I've him. never been a huge fan. I've only really known him from Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, and he's you know he's great in Guardians of the Galaxy. He fit, you know as someone who's read the comic books, he fits that character perfectly. Mm. Perfect casting. But yeah, he he's his acting days. I think. Uh, I, I say acting loosely now. Um, Mario coming up, hasn't he? Fucking oh, God, hell. his voice in that. Let's, let's not go there. That, I'm sure that'll win some sort of award next year. Oh, I hope not. Um, I love Mario. <laughs> but yeah, no, Jurassic World Dominion. Fucking waste of time. Same, it's practically the same film as it's Fallen the same Kingdom. same fucking film. It, I, it feels like we've watched the same film three times. Yeah. And they just threw in Laura Dern, Sam Neill, yeah. and Jeff Goldblum to get some sort of you know, um, buzz around yeah. the film. Bryce and it Dallas Howard. disappointing. Yeah. And Bryce Dallas Howard, she always tries her best. You yeah. Know? She she really like... does. No matter what material she's given, she's great. Um, but, yeah, it's fucking rough. And it ends the same way. I mean, spoiler alert, if you've seen Fallen Kingdom, you haven't seen Dominion yet. It ends the same way. Yeah. It, it, it ends the exact same way. It does nothing. Fallen Kingdom ended with dinosaurs roaming the earth. Great premise. This could have been fucking great, yeah. you know? But it does nothing with that. You forget about it. After the first five minutes, that's forgotten about. Yeah. It's just generic. Yeah. So generic. So basic. It's ridiculous. So, yeah. Can't recommend that one. <laughs> to our final two awards. The best podcast film of the year. I have a tie. It's, it's a tie. Between The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and The Exorcist. You know, two of the greatest films ever made. And it was an absolute blast covering them both. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. Both five star masterpieces. Um, my choice is, I want it to be a little different. Onibaba. Okay. 
Yeah. Because I think actually doing the podcast episode made me yeah, realize it actually made me love it just more. how yeah. amazing that film is and because it allowed me to discover one of my favorite films yeah beyond the valley of the dolls yeah yeah love yeah. that film absolutely and i'm so glad i chose it for the podcast yeah. for the worst podcast film of the year there's a few choices oh there's, there's a few we, it's been rough it has been um rough. for me though it has to be the nuttiest nutcracker because that's <gasps> the one where I was, it was the end of the triple bill of the Christmas tree some episode. I had had enough. I, I'd honestly, I found myself <laughs> drifting in and out of sleep. I was, I had nothing to write in my notes because nothing fucking happened. It was so boring. Um, and the fact that we managed to stretch out an episode with a big portion of it dedicated to that is a miracle. Yeah, I've gone festive as well. I've gone with elves. I yeah, thought elves yeah. was fucking terrible. It was. It was. Talking about. A film ending on a F slur. Well, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very disappointing because, again, that's a film that could have been fun. It could have. No, we hope it was fun for you to listen to us talking about yeah. it, but it wasn't fun for us to watch it. I feel like that's... And I had to choose it because that was the film I got most angry talking about, yeah. I feel, during the yeah. Well, episodes. yeah, I mean, there's things that we both realised as we were discussing the yeah. film that, you know, did not sit well. Nazi shit for no reason. So, we are now Ooh. on to... Our 20 best horror films of the year. Now, for anyone who is new, the rules are this. We both have 20. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, there are going to be a lot of crossovers here. Yes. Majority of it this year, I think, is crossovers. So whoever mentions the film first, we discuss the film at length. And then we move on when the other mentions it. Yes. Yeah. So we will discuss 20 <clears throat> films. But... We will. Maybe even more. Maybe even more. Oh, potentially, yeah. That's true. That's true. So, in at number 20... <gasps> da, 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 da. <laughs> what? In at number 20, it is, of course, Prey. Prey. Is that the same for you? That is the same for me at number 20. So, the Predator franchise over the years... I, do you know what? I can't say there's been one entry where I didn't enjoy it, unless we're counting the Alien vs. Predator films. I see. Uh, AVP2 specifically uh, and Predators of Adrian Brody that was a bit basic but I, I've, I've always enjoyed the franchise but there's never been including the first one there's never been one that I would say fuck yeah that is like one of the, the best things I've ever seen you know completely stand out or whatever Prey changed that because it did something completely different with it you know we had it in a different surrounding we had a female lead and the female representation is just fantastic. It makes up for the rest of the female representation in the franchise. Um, but, you know, taking place within the Kamank Nation as well, it really, it made a massive difference. It felt like something new. It felt like something fresh. It didn't feel like it was doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah, I really appreciated how they took something established and looked at it from a different direction. But still in keeping with the laws of what Predator is. Yeah. Really, you know, the whole idea of Predator and Prey is called Predator. You know, I enjoyed what they did there. I found it, you know, very tense. Strangely, Letterbox doesn't, um, doesn't... Uh, put it under horror films. That is strange. Because it's absolutely a horror film. It is a horror film. Yeah. I mean, it's... Someone being chased, you know, yeah. it's predator and prey, you know. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I loved the female representation. Um, I enjoyed the cinematography. Mm -hmm. I thought it looked fantastic. I was surprised it didn't get a wide release. It is shocking. It's just it is really Disney shocking. Plus. That should have been big screen. Material. Yeah, the fact that we're in a year on a big screen, I think. The fact that we're in a year where Bullet Train got a fucking wide release and this didn't, you yeah. know. Oh god! So oh my god! Talk about disappointment. Yeah. Could go on forever. Uh, yeah, and I thought the indigenous uh, American representation was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It, it really, yeah. you know, it, it delved into the culture and everything, yeah. and, and helped it fit into the Predator story perfectly. Yeah, and it opens up for so many more possibilities mm -hmm. as well, which I think is fantastic. Yeah. And Amber Midfunder was so fucking good in the lead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she was fantastic. 
going on to number 19, I have You Are Not My Mother. Yes, I am. <laughs> do you have the same? I certainly do. Okay. You Are Not My Mother. You Are Not My Mother. So this was a Glasgow Fright Fest film. And uh, you, when you go to Fright Fest, you know, obviously, your expectations, you're going with low expectations. And if you get something fantastic, then fucking great. That's a, a bonus. This was definitely one of those cases. Um, because with a premise like someone's mum going missing and coming back like a different person... It's been done so many times before that you kind of, you know, you expect, you know what you're expecting. But this completely took me by surprise. This was a really great folk horror um, written and directed by Kate Dolan as well. And this is her feature length debut. Oh, wow. Which is really impressive. Yeah, very impressive. Yeah, I loved the family dynamic. Yeah, Hazel Dupe and Carolyn Bracken. Uh, as the mother and daughter duo, so good. Yeah, re- really, the acting, and, and with films like this, the acting does have to be good. Yeah. And it was. Um, I just, I love the emotion of it. Sometimes, sometimes horror isn't necessarily, I'm going to cut off your head. Yeah. Or you, stuff like that. It's the emotional horror mm-hmm. as well. And the relationship between the, the mother and daughter, I feel, was really well done. It was, yeah. And that added to the horror, but also to the emotion. So it, it looked at it from a different angle to what we usually have with horror. Yeah, yeah. Which is fine, you know. I love all kind, kinds of horror, really. But it, it doesn't let that get in the way of the horror elements. No, You know, it no. kind of adds to it. And it, adds, it remembers it, it's a horror film. Yeah, and it adds to the stakes when you become emotionally invested in these characters. Mm. Um, I mean, there's one particular scene involving the dance that, had my jaw on the fucking ground. Like, the acting in that scene and what happened, it really one of my favourite scenes in any horror film of the year. It was fantastic. Uh, but yeah, and, and I believe it is readily available everywhere now. I think on video on demand, so I really can't recommend it enough. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm looking forward to what Kate Dolan does in the future. Yeah. So, next up at number 18, what do you have? I have Black Phone. Oh, okay, we'll discuss that now then. Yeah, Black Phone, the um, Ethan Hawke film. Yeah, it's got Derrickson, <laughs> Ethan Hawke film. Uh, the director of Sinister. <laughs> the director of Sinister. I liked, I liked Sinister, and I, I did like Black Phone as well. Um, I thought the um, I thought the premise was very creepy. Yeah. I thought the cinematography was fantastic. I thought Ethan Hawke was fantastic in that role. Mm-hmm. Really did, and I, I, I'm trying to find a good way to say this. I usually find children in films to be incredibly <laughs> annoying, uh, especially quite uh, pedantic ones. It's okay, the regular the regular listeners are fit enough enough. I think, it's fine. yeah, um, but I actually found the 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 kids in this and the. Um, the young actors mm. I actually found they did a good job and I found them quite yeah. endearing and I I cared about them which um yeah which very well done by the filmmakers because <laughs> you should oh fucking hell kill the yeah kids. no they're, they're all fantastic um performances and um I think as well you know they're well developed quite early on the characters and I think it really makes it easy to become invested in them and with how good Ethan Hawke is, it makes his character, like, massively unpredictable. And you, you never know what's going to happen next. You know, you don't feel like anyone's safe in the film. Especially means this is a guy who actually kills kids. This yeah. is the premise. Um, yeah, I love the 70s aesthetic. It yes. really, you know, it, it nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. And, uh, yeah, it, it's just, it's fantastic. It's really creepy. Uh, I think it was one of the scariest films of the year. Especially, there's a few jump scares in there that are utilised really well. Which, it's easy in modern horror to just throw a jump scare in for cheap effect. But I think it was done really well here. And, yeah, I mean, even the psychological side of things, it just, it worked brilliantly. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, obviously I'd put it at number 18. For me, I'm not very good at ranking films. (laughs) So, Tell people that are the 20 best films of the year there, episode. There, no, but in, in terms of, I mean, there's not much in it. 
I, I like I enjoyed it, but I, I didn't enjoy it as much as the others. But it was it was good. Well, my number eight. I just I just feel like maybe people might think that's quite low on the list, but it's not to say I didn't enjoy it. Well, my number 18 is a complete departure from the tones of the black phone. A complete uh, tonal shift. It's the Once and Future Smash. Ooh. Uh, which is actually a mockumentary uh, that technically, you know, the mockumentary itself isn't a horror film, but it is a horror film as a whole because of its subject matter. And it is hilarious. If you are a fan of horror films and you are aware if you're big on your eighties cult horror. Yeah, and you are aware of the kind of horror fandom that exists, this is the film for you because it's hilarious. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my mum wouldn't get wouldn't get it. <laughs> you know your, your nan wouldn't understand. But if you are a horror yeah. film buff, this is top-notch comedy yeah if, if you're part of the horror instagram community and you're aware of all the cons and mm. you know in particular yeah honestly this is the perfect film it's so so fucking funny it, it you know it, the fact that it's a mockumentary I, I find must i found myself at times forgetting that it's a mockumentary because of how realistic they made it <laughs> so it's about a fake film yeah. you know and these these are actors playing these these characters in this film and it's just, it really makes you wonder why no one's done this before. Because it, it's, it's a genius idea. And it's just everything. It just gets funnier as it goes along. And, you know, the many talking heads interviews that we get in it. You know, like, fucking Mark Patton's in this. And, you know, cast members from random Friday the 13th sequels. Lloyd <laughs> Kaufman's in it. Um, Todd Farmer. You know, and it's, it's great. Because they are fully committed to what's going on here. Yeah. And that's what makes it funnier. Like, the little things, like, you know... And I think I mentioned this on our Friday first episode, but where they discussed... The, the whole idea that one person could say they acted as this character in a mask, and you, you can't really say they didn't, because it's a character in a mask, you know? Very much falls into a lot of what Chris says on the podcast about, you know, the many Jasons over the years of Leatherface. How, you know, anyone could put on a mask and play those characters... So, you know, centering a whole film around that, it's oh, hilarious. That. Absolutely hilarious. <laughs> and Michael St. Michaels and Bill Whedon, they, they play the main characters so well. They do, they do, actually. They've got really great comedy chops. Yeah. Number... Well, fuck, what number are we? 17. <laughs> Enjoyed talking about it so much, I forgot what number one. 17. 17. I have Watcher. Okay, let's talk about that now. Um, yeah, fantastic, um, kind of, I described it as <laughs> the last two episodes of Sex and the City, where Sarah Jessica Parker is lonely in Paris, <laughs> mixed with Rear Window, and if that sounds good to you, like it did to me, you're going to enjoy Watcher. Yeah. I don't want to give away too much. It is kind of, um, it's, it's a difficult one to describe without giving away too much. Yeah, I mean, the basic premise is a woman is it's being kind of, yes. in Bucharest. Yes, she's lonely and she thinks something iffy's going on. And, and it keeps you guessing. The writing is so good. It yeah. really keeps you guessing throughout. Um, directed by... Uh, Chloe Acuno, and this is her feature length debut, and I'm so glad to see you know so many women getting their feature length debuts this year, and they're all fucking fantastic. Women make the best horror, and you know I will always stand by that. And this is a great example of it. She also, I think women make. I'm just going to say this one now. I think women make the best horror now because we're seeing things from a different perspective. Yeah, yeah. and we're seeing the fit. You know. We're seeing these kind of films from the woman's perspective. Mm -hmm. So we've had films like Rear Window, Disturbia, yeah, which are quite similar in plot. Mm -hmm. But now we're seeing it written by a woman, yeah, featuring a woman, and we're seeing that perspective, and it feels so fresh, mm. and it feels new. It, yeah. it, it's it's a new take, and you know, shockingly, not I, I 
if I remember correctly, you know, Rear Window came out 70 years ago. Mm. Why is it taken 70 years to see it from this perspective? Yeah. You know, a woman's perspective yeah. on this kind of, you know, uh, plot. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if I remember mm. right, let me just double check. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's also, um, it is also co-written by Zach Ford. So it's co-written by a man as well. But yeah. It is the female perspective that really shines through because, you know, of course, women, if they're out alone at night or just out walking in general, they a lot of the time they have to feel on edge. Yeah. And and that is portrayed here perfectly. And it really is anxiety inducing. It yeah. it's there's some scenes in this film that had my palms sweating. I mean like the cinema scene. You know, where she's just going to the cinema and the guy, it, it was actually a really great um, homage to The Howling, where the guy just leans and starts breathing on it. It's fucking terrifying. It, yeah. You know, it doesn't need lots of gore or anything like that. It relies heavily on suspense and it's fantastic. And it's the idea of a woman in danger not being believed. Yeah. And it's something that only women can relate yeah. to. So you have to have that female perspective on it. We're not saying that every film should be directed and written by... You know, every film that's about women mm. should be written, directed, produced by women. But women should be involved. Yeah, There's absolutely. so many films absolutely. about women out there that you're like, have you met a woman before? Yeah. And it's about using common sense. Look at a wounded fawn. You know, uh, not many of them top 20, but again, another highlight from this year... A film about an experience a woman goes through and, it, you know, you could tell from the directors talking about it at Fright Fest. It, very sincere. And you just have to use common sense and not be a fucking moron. Yeah. To know what women go through. But you it know? felt like women were very much involved in the filmmaking process. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And about the end product. Mm. Now, it's not saying men cannot direct no, films exactly. about women. Yeah. But you have to get them involved. Yeah. Yeah. In some way. You know, we can't mention and, what and give him some money for it. Yeah, well. absolutely. Right. We can't mention Watcher without mentioning Micah Monroe. Oh, of course. So she started out in uh, she was it follows and the guest, and I thought she was going to become like a massive screen queen um, over the years, and she kind of just I don't know she just wasn't in a lot since then, but she's back and she's in this, and her performance is within my top twenty performances of the year because she is so fucking good. And she looks absolutely stunning. She serves so many looks throughout this film. She's given blonde bombshell in the fifties, and I, I, yeah, just absolutely incredible. Yeah, she she really puts on a fantastic performance. I, I'm actually quite pleased that we got to see this in the cinema as yes. well. Yes, yeah, this was wide release. Mm -hmm. I think it was yeah like, it was yeah. I think it was like one or two showings a day but I'm so pleased for a debut you yeah. know and I, I hope this kind of reignites um, Mike, Michael Monroe's well, career I hope so as well I mean degree. Chloe Akuno has already been given uh, the next Fear Street oh okay so, nice yeah, it's great to see that she's getting more work and something, you know, as mainstream as that. Yeah, absolutely. You know? My number 17 is Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Oh. Now, this was a surprise because the trailer, it made it look it could have gone one of two ways. Um, it could have been, you know, massively cringe. It, you know, it, it could have been a lackluster, but this is a film that is predominantly made by women. I mean, written, produced, directed, starring, and it fucking shows, and it is fantastic. I feel like on rewatches, this could be even higher off my list. I loved this. Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, I am a bit of a grumpy millennial, and I thought this was going to be Gen Z. Look at me on my iPhone. <laughs> Throughout the whole thing, and I just it would I thought it would just get on my nerves, but actually, you know, the humor is very nuanced. It's silly. It's yeah, makes fun of Gen Z to a certain degree, and to you know millennials as well. Let's be fair. Um, it's 
just a fun film. Yeah. Really. It's it's very silly, but not stupid. It's perfect for 2022. The yeah. dialogue is phenomenal because they really capture what people talk like these days. And it's used in such a great way. Um, and it's hilarious. It really is hilarious. The big argument scene near, near the end of the film. Oh, my God. So funny. So, so funny. Um, and the cast, there's not a single bad performance in this. Everyone brings their A-game. It's so... Every, the dynamic between everyone is great. Because they could be best friends one minute and they'll be turning against each other the next. And where is the lie? That is so realistic these days. It is so realistic. Um, yeah. And the twist, honestly... Obviously not going to say what it is. I've never... I don't think I've laughed so much at a film in the cinema. It's so fucking funny. So, so funny. Um, completely blows everything else that came before it out of the water once that twist is revealed. And I kind of... I, I want to rewatch it now knowing that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, um... Okay, what you say? No, no. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm trying to uh, bypass <clears throat> talking about the ending in case. Um, yeah, I just, uh... The word triggered yeah. it, it has never it's made me laugh so used much. Used to great effect. Used to great film. effect. Um, yeah. And it, it's, it's intense. It doesn't forget to be a horror film. Um, there there yeah, are moments was, that had yeah. me on the edge of my seat. I didn't know where it was. I genuinely <laughs> had no idea where it was going. It's the most unpredictable film of the year, easily. Unless we're counting uh, Barbarian, because that, that was quite unpredictable. Um, but yeah. Barbarian but, no. was kind of unpredictable. <laughs> well. But yeah, bodies, bodies, bodies. And uh, I mean, it ends with a fucking Charlie XCX song. What more can you say? No. How more Gen Z can you get? Hey, don't come for Charlie. For the, the, the twinks and the uh, the girls. I'm certainly not a twink and I love Charlie XCX. But you're girly pop though, aren't you? Well, yeah. Oh, don't. I'm not sure what that means. I've heard it said. I've heard it said on TikTok. Are you sure you're gay? Yeah, who knows. Number 16, I have... Torn Hearts. Oh. Do you have to say? I don't know. Okay. Very low Torn Hearts. Well, Must again. Must have been a good year. Fantastic year. And this was late night film at Fright Fest. A film that didn't have the highest uh, IMDb rating. Oh my God. Ridiculously low. I swear it's like on a 5.2. Something like that, yeah. It's embarrassing. And you, know, so you, you don't expect much. But I did have faith because it's, of course, directed by Bria Grant. I love Bria Grant. She is... Honestly, she's a name that deserves to be mentioned more within horror because she has done some fucking great work over the last few years and I really can't wait to see what she does next. This is by far my favourite thing to come from her yet because this is just everything me and Chris love about films thrown into one. It is. Uh, and I suppose the 5.2 is... Because it's straight not... people who don't get it. Yeah, yeah, straight people who don't get it. It's <laughs> camp. It's ca- It's camp. It's a mix. It's camp, and that, that's the only way to describe it and how wonderful it is. Cause yeah. It's so ridiculous, but so amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's. It's like I, in... I loved it, and I love hag exploitation, and I think it's a hag exploitation. It film. is absolutely hag exploitation. I think it's a hag exploitation. It's Katie Segal from Married with Children, Sons of Anarchy, um, Futurama, fantastic actress, lover. I was a big fan of Eight Simple Rules when I was younger, so I, I love a bit of Katie Segal. Is it Segal? 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 I'd say. Um, well, thanks for my skills. Yeah. <laughs> What? Sigga Sigga. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, love her. And to see her in a sort of hag exploitation kind of role yeah. was amazing. Yeah. I, I loved it. I really just really enjoyed it. it. It feels like a mix of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, Psycho, Sunset Boulevard, The Fan, and Die, Die, My Darling. And, and uh, what a mashup TV that is. show Nashville. Yeah. Because it's about country music as well, uh-huh. which is camp, inherently camp. Yeah. Country music is camp. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, Abby Quinn and Alexis Lemaire, they both do fantastic jobs here as as the leads. Fucking hell, Katie Segal absolutely chews that scenery. She does. She, her one-liners in this film are so, so camp. The dialogue is fantastic and she's just relentless. She's just so entertaining to watch. 
she's a, she's a very very good actress. I like her a lot. She can do and anything really. Yeah. She can do the comedy. I'm not sure if was it her singing. <laughs> Who knows? It's probably. Who knows who it's probably. Singing. She's uh, she's a triple threat, ladies and gentlemen. She's yeah, a triple threat. Yeah. This is just. It's just fun to watch, and it's you know again, it doesn't forget to be a horror film either. You know, it's. Yeah, it, it has this horror element. Yeah, you, you feel like these girls are actually in danger being with Katie Sakal. Yeah, you know? it's, it's nice to have the horror on the side, but for me, it's it's the um, campastic nature yes. of the film that really. Yeah. It is. Drew me in. Yeah. A film that definitely deserved a bigger release than it got. Definitely. Was it just randomly put on Hulu? It's on, it's on Sky Store now. In the VOD. UK. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was made for Hulu. And it's Blumhouse though. as well. You know, one of, yeah. one of the uh, biggest Blumhouse standouts. Yeah. In fact, you know what? Looking at my ranked list now, I'd, it is the best Blumhouse film of the year. Okay. Yeah. For me, anyway. I thought Scream was. Blumhouse. Scream was not Blumhouse. Oh. No. Did I make that up? Oh, Halloween. Up. Halloween oh. ends. Oh, I get Halloween confused. ends is not in the top 20. I get confused. So, what is your number 16? My number 16 is Candyland. Oh. Uh, not based on the board game. Certainly not. Uh, certainly not. Just a really grimy throwback to sort of grindhouse. It is. It is. Yeah. Re- it feels very dirty but in a good way yeah it's it doesn't feel exploitative no but you know it's it's saucy it's it is violent at times and uh i really enjoyed it yeah the fact that the protagonists are sex workers as well yeah. i love that you know very 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 progressive and uh you know it's just it's always refreshing to see the antagonist though um <laughs> Wow, I've never, I've ever hated a villain so much in a oh fucking God, yeah, film. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, the villain in this film, um, she's very religious heavy, um, and, and infiltrates her way in to, to this group of, of sex workers. And fuck me, the, the actress does such a fantastic job uh, in the role and makes it fully believable that she's so evil and... Yeah, I was gripped throughout. And, and like you said, you know, it's a great throwback to Grindhouse Cinema and really nails that aesthetic of that era. You know, the soundtrack and the cinematography and everything. It's just really, really intense. I thought it looked great as well. It, it did. It I, did. I, I thought it really looked great. Uh, written and, and directed by John Swab. Yeah. Who, you know, written and directed by a man. But it actually felt like he'd met a woman yeah. in his yeah. life it really felt like it didn't feel like the nudity was exploitative um, it had something to say Yeah, it wasn't judgmental of sex workers no. at all I, and I, I didn't get that I didn't, I, I, I've never been a sex worker but from my perspective it didn't feel judgmental no. it felt quite honest and real no. in fact the, the judgmental part was coming from the villain and yeah. the fact that that's the villain being judgmental. That says a lot of how positive it is. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. I just. I thought it was. It was sleazy, but with a heart there. Yeah. You know, it was sleazy by design and uh, didn't feel offensive. No. It was. Yeah. It was a a fun film. But yeah. With something to say as well. Which yeah. Is always good. Absolutely. And my number. Oh wait, was that sixteen? Oh that my god, was, I'm losing that track. That was my 16. number sixteen. So number fifteen. Fifteen. Number fifteen for me is the menu. Oh, is that yours? No. Okay. No. no. Number, yeah, the, the menu again could have been higher. Might be higher on the rewatch, but again, where did this film come from? <laughs> so random. So many films that just look like they could just be throwaway horror films and they're far from it and this is definitely one of them you know um the idea of these people these these rich people going to an island just to eat at this guy's restaurant um it's a massive satire on foodie culture these days you know and we get that with the people taking pictures of their food completely over explaining it with words that they probably don't know 
what even mean. Um, it's it's a perfect satire, and it's hilarious. If you, if you know these sort of people that it's mocking, it's hilarious. But it, this is a great horror film. It is really intense at times, um, and the performances are just fantastic. It's one of those films, and it, it it's one of those films that successfully has, oh my god, 99% of its cast, of its characters, be highly unlikable. Yeah. But still works. Yeah. Because I, I still invested. It's a comedy. Um, Triangle of Sadness does something very similar as well, mm -hmm. um, which is one of my favourite films of the year. Um, it puts together some very highly unlikable people mm -hmm. when you're like, who's the antagonist and who's yeah. the protagonist? Whose side am I on? And no no spoilers, but there is, you know, someone whose side we are on. Yeah. But that isn't always revealed. No. And so it's kind of like, fuck you all yeah. <laughs> at times. Yeah. So like, oh, you know? And uh, I just really enjoyed it. I thought it was very funny. It came completely out of nowhere. Uh -huh. I mean, we randomly watched a trailer. The trailer came on whilst we were at the cinema. I was like, oh, God. You know, this is going to be some sort of, um, like parody on Gordon Ramsay or mm. something and it, it wasn't it wasn't that no. it was anything it was a, a parody of elitism yeah it's, it's so stylish as well like the having oh, a different great. the food um, recipes come up on the screen and everything it's so good uh, Anya Taylor-Joy is the the MVP here she I yes I agree nominated I for a Golden Globe very well deserved but I also think Ray Fiennes Absolutely. did a yeah. fantastic he's, he's just a job. Yeah. Fantastic. And I, I feel like more than Anya Taylor-Joy, even though she did a fantastic job, the film was riding on Ray Fiennes yeah. giving a good performance. And, how, and he did. Yeah, and how serious he was in the role. Considering he has to say some pretty fucking ridiculous stuff, he fully commits. Yeah. Just like he did when he uh, read out Lisa Barlow's hot mic moment on... What he like. did. He certainly um, did. But Anya Taylor Joy is just effortlessly cool in us. Like she's always she's from the me... moment she lights up her first sig. Yeah. You know, what's yeah. she giving you? Uh, Haley Williams. She is the house down boots. Um, but yeah, like when we were at the cinema, um, there was another scene of her smoking, and someone on the back row took a picture with the flash on. I wasn't that even was mad. Very, I was so, like, go on, someone... Someone's got a fetish. When you say that, I smoking. say it was no. another another one of us queens it and wasn't. was standing out and you tell Joy smoking. No, you know, I've seen it in the pat <laughs> randomly, you know, searching an actress on YouTube, as <laughs> I do, and there's whole videos dedicated to them smoking. People people have a fetish for these things, which is, I'm, I'm not shaming anyone. No. But she looks know, amazing. Don't take say. pictures whilst I'm trying to watch a film <laughs> at the cinema. Thank you. Um, yeah. What's your number fifteen? My number fifteen is fresh. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. A little low. 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 Um. I know. I, I. I really liked fresh. I did. I did really like fresh. Um. It was interesting, and uh, yeah. What did you think to fresh? Am I struggling to I think friends? what you're saying <laughs> is what you're saying is the reason this is even on your list is because the lead character has the Golden Girls theme song. Like the <laughs> yeah, that's so true. I'm sorry. Can I just apologise? I'm sure you've seen on social media. I haven't been feeling my best recently, so I'm, if I'm a little confused at times, I don't play it. It's not because I didn't enjoy the film. Oh, the Sebastian Stan cannibal film. Yeah. Yes, of course. Of course. I, I did enjoy this. It was very good. Again, feature length debut from Mimi Cave. And this one went to Disney Plus. So I'm very glad this got dis the distribution it deserved. It, again, should have been a big screen film. Um, I was absolutely gripped from start to finish. It's so fucking good. And... Oddly enough, one of two films on this um, on my top twenty that are uh, about cannibals. It's been the year of the cannibal. It has, apparently, it has. according to um, Twitter. Yeah, it's been the year of the cannibal. 
Um, this genuinely has some scenes that look fucking disgusting uh, with, with the cannibalism. Um, it, it is one of those that, if, if anything's going to make me feel a bit sick in a horror film, it's cannibalism, and, and this does it really well. Uh, but Daisy Edgar Jones is absolutely incredible in this as uh, as Noah in the lead role. And so is Sebastian Stan, because obviously, you know, Sebastian Stan these days, what the most people associate him with, being fucking Bucky in the MCU, you wouldn't accept, expect him to be the sort of character he is in this film. Um, he is, he's so creepy and so slimy, uh, but I, I couldn't get enough, I wanted to see more. And it's very much a film that shows how terrible modern dating can be and the dangers of meeting creeps through dating. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like... But on an extreme level. Yeah. I feel like there's been a few films this year that revolve around being suspicious of seemingly charming men. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's a cautionary tale. Sign of the times. Yeah. Definitely. Anything else, you have, anything else to say about this? I mean, it's, it's your next choice. Yeah, no, it was fine. <laughs> it, it was fine. It was... It was it's fine. It was... It was good. <laughs> Yes, I, I will rave about this film. It's higher on my list, that, and I really can't recommend it enough. On to my number 14. We've already discussed it. It's the Black Phone. Ah. Uh, so what is your number 14? What's some future smash? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> number 13, for me, is Bones and All. Another ah, cannibal nice. film. Another cannibal. Is that your film. number thirteen? No, 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 a bit, a bit higher, a little bit, bit higher. higher. Um, yeah. So, again, it, this is the year of the cannibal. Um, this one was art house cannibal, should we say? Mm. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. So this uh, is directed by uh, the director of Suspiria remake and called by your name, Luca Guadagino. I hope I pronounced that right. And he's a fantastic director. He's so good at what he does. He's not missed so no, far, as far as no. I'm concerned. I, I mean, we've only seen those two. Um, but this feels like a blend of those two. Um, what I appreciate here, which I really did not expect at all, is that anyone within the LGBTQ plus community could find something to relate to within this story. Mm. Um, I assume the director is a gay man. He is a gay man. Um, and this very much feels, specifically with a set within the 80s, it very much feels like a an allegory for being in the LGBTQ plus community at that time. You know, when HIV was around, uh, well, when it was obviously, I mean, it's still around, obviously, but when it was, when everyone assumed it was a life sentence and, you know, homophobia was at a rise because of this, you know. Um, it, it very much feels like that's what they're going for here. And if this is any other film, um, I would say, do you need to have an allegory in 2022? Can't you just say what you're trying to say? But this works. The way the story's told, this works. And it feels so sincere and so heartfelt. And yeah, it's just perfect. Yeah, it's a relatability. And we look at it from our perspective. Yeah. We look at it from the perspective of two homosexual men mm -hmm. what a great film does like this one what a great film does is allows you to project your own identity mm. onto these sort of subjects we're not cannibals we obviously never want to be cannibals we obviously have an <laughs> you know we're against mm -hmm. cannibalism yeah. okay just so you know i just thought i'd have just in case the fbi are listening in Duh. but what we can what a good film is able to do is allow us to empathize or uh, sympathize with cannibals yeah like we we're on their side yeah. we're like oh my god because you know? we're looking at it as something other than cannibalism yeah but also because it the film is so well made mm -hmm. that we're able to do that. And obviously we don't always agree with their actions. But they've created these two characters that we are invested in. That we do want to see the best for. And, you know, that takes a lot of skill. Yeah. I 
thing, and, and I I like the acting between the two leads. Oh, um, Taylor Russell and Timothy Chalamet. Taylor Russell were, were both fantastic. Timothy Chalamet. But I think Mark Rylance yes. put on a fantastic he did. performance. I think I think he's a fantastic actor anyway. But I thought he was really fucking good. Yeah. And I think if if there's any Oscar buzz, it's it's I don't think there will be. But I think if there is, Mark Rylance should Absolutely. be close to the yeah. top of that it's list. So creepy in this. So um, creepy. You just you again, you know, like Ethan Hawke in the Black Phone, you feel uncomfortable when he's on screen because you don't know what he's going to do next. Um, and he, he, yeah, he really portrays that really well. We also get a cameo from Jessica Harper, Queen. We certainly do love that. Love we, that for us. We need this director to make more films so we can see more Jessica Harper because she of always course. pops up in them. Um, David Gordon Green as well. Yeah, David Gordon Green's <laughs> randomly in this. Um, but also. The soundtrack. Mm. You know, you're gonna give me an eighties road trip film, you you gotta give me a good eighties soundtrack, and that is what it delivers. You know, we get Joy Division, New Order, Duran Duran. In fact, the atmosphere uh by Joy Division, Needle Drop, is probably one of the best of the year. It's so fucking good. Um and again, you know, fantastic cinematography. It for a film with such a dark subject matter and uh, quite a downbeat film, it looks really breezy and you know, like really summery and it looks lovely. Yeah, yeah, I really, I, I actually really enjoyed Bones and All. Yeah, and the opening scene, oh my god, really jarring. Yes, oh god, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah that is when yeah. practical effects are used that was in really this film. Well made. Yeah, they they're used really well. Yes. So, what is your number twelve? Thirteen. Thirteen. You said thirteen. 13. It was. No, that no, was 14. No, I'm going to mix... Oh, my God. Bloody One hell. year, we'll record this this end of year episode and I won't get confused. Certainly What's your 13? No Carol Vorderman over there. Um, number 13 is Piggy. Okay, higher up on mine. Which I said way too excitedly because it's actually really quite a dark film. It is a dark film. <laughs> Very dark film. Um, fan, I, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, really enjoyed it. Another... It's a Spanish film. Um... Written and directed by a woman, yep. Carlotta Pereira. Um, it's when you look at the poster and the name, it did. I I was sort of like, ugh. We what skipped are we it at Fright Fest. Here? Yeah, because we obviously, you know, we've gone to Fright Fest and Grim Fest. You get to pick and choose what you want to miss, what you want to see, and that. It genuinely. When you watch the trailer, we thought this could be a really iffy, fat phobic film. You know, yeah. It, I mean, it's the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, I don't know what that says about the generation we've grew up in, but yeah, I mean, I assumed it would be really iffy. Could well, not I have been just, any more wrong. What I was expecting was Carrie, but with, you know, a plus sized central character. Yeah. And I thought, oh, God. She's going to get bullied throughout the whole thing and it's just going to be... And then she gets her revenge at the end because she's telekinetic or something like that. And that's not to say Carrie is one of my favourite films of all yeah. time. I would have been okay with that, but I thought maybe it, that there might be a lot of jokes at the lead actress's uh, that's expense. What, that's what I was expecting. Yeah, I thought it was going to be a comedy. And it was not. No. It was very well made. It was very interesting because there are uh moral sort of questions that are brought yeah. up throughout the film um i i just thought it was fantastic i don't want to give away another one i don't want to give away too yeah. much it's about. probably the most inventive take on the slasher genre we've seen in yeah. quite some time yeah um laura gallan is so fucking good in the lead role she has some really tough scenes to act out mm. here uh, it must have been emotionally draining for her to play this role, and she's so fucking good. Like she just fully commits throughout, and it really is easy to become invested in her character. Um, you know, you kind of want it to turn into revenge porn at points with how horrible the people are to her, and then you question why you yeah. feel that way. Yeah, and it's you know the cinematography; it's grimy, dirty, sweaty. Um, the soundtrack's really subtle, but it builds an atmosphere. It's just a really, really well-made film. 
Um, and again, you know, women make the best horror. And this, you can tell, is written by a woman. It always, it's always obvious in this one. Yeah, yeah, and and respect to, uh, and respectful, excuse yeah, me, respectful yeah. of the subject matter. Yeah, and you know, on paper, there could be one specific person you could call a villain in this film. But realistically, when you really look into it. There's multiple villains in yeah. this film. Um, but that's that's which is the why moral questions yeah. that arise. It's so well written uh, and really makes you think about it. It, yeah. it really is a fantastic film. Yeah, I thought it was brilliant. Really enjoyed it. So now I can give you my number 12. Oh. And oh God, I wanted this to be so much higher, but again, it's been such a good year. I wanted this to be fucking number one, if I'm honest. But, you know, there's a lot left to discuss. It is hypochondriac. That's that's low. That is that's low. very low. It deserves to be higher. It's yeah. Especially means this one resonated so much and it really got me, should we say? Yes. It it, it um there's a lot of relatability in here and you know I've mentioned it a few times in the podcast that I suffer from health anxiety myself. Uh, this is what that film. Uh, this is what the film's about. This is what the film's about and. The representation, 100% spot on perfect. Could not get any better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, e- even if you look at like an- anxieties and depression as a whole, you know, there's, there's something to relate to here. Um, and before going into it, you know, I wasn't sure how triggering it was going to be. I-, I wasn't sure if it would be exploited for horror purposes. But it fits into the horror perfectly in a way that resonates where you kind of understands and it does feel like you're in a horror film when you're going through it and it's very clear that writer director addison Heyman, he's clearly been through this this is his real life experiences and that adds so much heart and sincerity to the film itself and it it always shines through and zach villa again another one of my top 20 performances of the year one of my top 10 performances because he is so good it's it's a powerhouse performance it's a subject matter i've never seen in horror before and it's actually probably something you've seen more in comedy. Yeah. Really. Well, I mean, we watched Ferris Bueller last night. It's very much Cameron. That Ferris Bueller. Yeah, that sort of uh, hypochondria is played for laughs in a lot of yeah. films. So it did make us a little nervous, obviously, with uh, Gary's sort of history and, mm. and him being able to relate to the subject matter. Um, but it was really, really well made the subject matter obviously coming from a place of being through the same thing himself <clears throat> the, the the writer director yeah he treated it with a lot of respect yeah um and it, it's one of those films i it's not something i've dealt with personally but i'm sure sure for gary there are certain films that hit differently yeah absolutely from and it's not to say that they're bad films for other people, mm. fantastic films, yeah. but they hit differently because they're relatable. Yeah, there's some, there's some films that are just objectively good. Like, Bones and All, no one could say, that's a bad film. Because it's not. Objectively, it's not. It's very well made, you know. There's so much there that could, that could be put forward for a good argument for it being a good film. Yeah. Yeah. But Hypochondriac... If you don't get it, then maybe there's there's not a lot to enjoy here. And, and it's got a low rate on IDB. I don't get it. But, I mean, as a whole, I think it's very well made. I think as a horror film, it really works. But it's even more... It, it's, it's even better when you can relate to it. And that's not to say, I hope you've been through it and so you can enjoy this film. Um, I obviously don't. But as someone who has been through it, it, it really does hit on a different level. And it is, you know, it's really personal it's really touching and it's honestly really disturbing in some scenes as well yeah absolutely it, i think it really shows very well the horrors of mental health it does you know uh, having issues with mental health should i say yeah um yeah i thought it was really well made is that another debut i i think it's another debut yeah and yeah. Marlene um, Fort, or Forte, um, I believe might be how you pronounce her name, she also provides a standout performance as uh, the lead character's mother. Because, I mean, you know, as well as dealing with the mental health side of things and everything, it deals with absent families and, and difficult family relationships. And she is fantastic in her role. 
She's so good. Yeah. Yeah, really. Just, you know, very well done. And with a real weird... Uh, real weird, excuse me. A real queer sense of Oh my God, it's so gay. So gay. It's so I gay. really appreciate. There is... Maybe um, that's... I, I don't know. I don't know what goes through people's minds when they watch films. I'm, I can only tell you how I feel. There's a difference between IMDb and Letterboxd. I believe this is rated higher on Letterboxd than it is on IMDb. IMDb is... I, I really think the people who vote on there, I think it's dominated by a lot of uh, straight white people. And yeah. Those people aren't going to get it. They're not going to get this. Uh, purely for the queer side of things, because, you know, there, there was a guy sat next to me at Fright Fest who turned away when two of the male characters kissed. Um, I think that really tells you all you need to know. I th- yeah, I, th- I think there's still a way to go before yeah. having real queer representation in, in horror. But in in the, cinema, really. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in a year where Harry Styles has gone on interviews saying how he's, you know, he's done all of us a favour, he's done the gays a favour because he provided sensual sex scenes in his policeman film. This has a fucking ribbon scene. I mean... Yes. Spoiler. <laughs> you know... <laughs> So thanks, Harry, but we're okay over here. I mean, this game is everything we needed. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, best sex scene of the year also goes to Hypochondriac. I didn't know there was an award. No, but if there is, then that's who it goes to. <laughs> and it, yeah, by the way, just please watch this film. Whether, whether you can relate to it or not, it doesn't matter. Watch it. It needs to be seen. It, it is a fantastic film. It, when I say it hits on a different level when you can relate... It's still really well made. The horror yeah. is still there. It's a fantastic film. Yeah. Really fantastic. What's next for you? Oh, can you remember what number we're on? Twelve. Twelve. Twelve for me is Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. There we go. What's your number eleven? Eleven is Torn Hearts. Mine is Watcher. Watcher. Fantastic. Uh, coming at number ten for me is Piggy. Oh, we're in our top tens. Ten for me is The Menu. Number nine for me is Candyland. Number nine is Bones and All. Oh, wow. Chris. <laughs> uh, so, a number eight for me is Fresh. Oof. Controversially, number eight for me is Pearl. <gasps> <laughs> oh, my God. So, do you want us to get homophobic abuse? What? <laughs> It's in my top ten for fuck's sake. Yes, it's fine. Oh, oh, yeah. Does that mean that means? Okay, well we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to it. Yeah, go on in, you straight man. Tell us Pearl. about, I just... about Pearl. Okay, I loved Pearl. I did. I did love Pearl. I feel like I have to defend me not putting. No, you don't. No, I'm only five. joking. You carry on. Instead of saying how much I enjoyed it. Yes. Yeah, loved Pearl. Real camp sensibility. Um, came out of nowhere for me. It literally came really? out of nowhere. The fact that X came out of nowhere and this was made at the same time as X. Yeah. And now we're getting a third film as well. It's unbelievable. And the fact that, you know, sometimes when you make films at the same time and they're thrown out there, Matrix Revolutions, um, uh, Revelations, or whatever it was. No, you're on about Resurrections. That was last year. Oh, Lord. Um, but yeah, the, Matrix Reloaded and Matrix Revelations, they were made at the same time. Matrix Revelations is a bit of a mess. It, you know, you kind of think one, one film is going to get more focused than the other. Ty West fucking nailed these two films. Completely nailed them. How he managed to do it, I don't know. But the fact that they're two completely separate films as well, in tones and everything. Yeah. Really, really did a fantastic job. And Pearl, written, co-written... By a woman, the official Tony Collette of 2023. <laughs> it's Mia Goth. Mia Goth. Yeah, Mia Goth, the modern Shelley Duvall. I love her. I thought she was absolutely fantastic in Pearl. Really gave a great performance. What I really liked about Pearl is I wasn't sure if I was expecting the same as X, but I didn't think it would go as far removed from X as it did. Yeah. And still did it really well. I love the reference points. Very Wizard of Oz. Uh-huh. Uh, very old school Hollywood, you know, silent film era. Yeah, the cinematography is like a Disney film. Yeah, it's... absolutely. But it, it's pure horror. It has many horror elements. 
and ultimately it it lives or dies on the main performance mm. by Mia Goth yeah. as Pearl, and she is fantastic. Yeah, really fantastic. A wonderful mm. actress. She's been memed to death. <laughs> you know, you know, you've made it when you've been memed to death. Uh, just, re- just a really enjoyable film. A great film. It's like I said about Torn Hearts, you know, there's a lot of whatever happened to Baby Jane here. But also, it kind of feels like it's a lot of Carrie, Straight Jacket, Psycho, and even fucking Grey Gardens. Grey Gardens. <laughs> Giving me, and it wasn't an influence that I've seen them reference in interviews. It definitely wasn't. Oh it? my god, Grey Gardens, the house down boot. And I fucking yeah. love Grey Gardens. Yeah. There's even a dance scene. Little Edie. There's a dance scene with Little Edie and Grey Gardens. That's absolutely a reference for the dance scene in this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's just fucking fantastic. And it, like I said, you know, the technical cinematography, oh my God, it looks beautiful. It looks like a children's fairy tale, mm. uh, which makes the horror element, the horror elements hit even harder. Um, you know, everyone in the cast does a great job, but Mia Goff is just, we all know she's going to be snubbed for an Oscar, but she fucking deserves one. This isn't the kind of film that gets nominated for an Oscar, no. unfortunately. I was surprised that she didn't get nominated for the Golden Globe. I love Anya Taylor-Joy, but if it's out of the two of them, That's Mia Goff true, actually. Yeah, that is a surprising one. Was uh, Anya Taylor-Joy uh, Anya Taylor-Joy nominated for Best Actress or something? It would have been best, for best actress. actress. Yeah, yeah, uh, for comedy or yeah. Musical. I suppose it is a comedy. So. Well, what? How would you describe this? Horror. This is definitely horror. Yeah, but there's no. So for the Golden Globes, you either get drama. I know. I know. Or comedy slash music. Yeah, I remember when Get Out was nominated for best comedy. Um, it really, seems a bit problematic now. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. Either way, they should be nominated for something yes. because yeah. Yeah, she she is fantastic. Spoiler alert: I prefer it to X, but it's very close. It's very close. Yeah, uh, and I cannot wait for Maxine uh, next year. Yes, I think it's when it's being released. Is that going to be a horror film? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know because they could easily get away with it not being a horror film. Yeah, really. But that character. Yeah. Yeah. So, that was your number eight, wasn't it? That was my yeah. number eight. Coming in at number seven for me, it's Werewolf by Night. Ooh. What's your, is, is your number seven Werewolf by Night? No. no. Um, so, we didn't know whether to include this because it's only 50 minutes long. Yeah. Um, it's classed as a TV special on IMDb, but, you know, it's near enough the length of a film and I, I it, it, for me... Obviously, I'm a, I'm a Marvel fan, and I've enjoyed, you know, everything that's been put out within Phase 4. For me, this was better than a lot of the feature-length films in Phase 4. Um, this was so new and so fresh for the MCU. And, you know, a lot of times people try and cling on to that and say, oh, yeah, this is like nothing you've seen before. This is like nothing you've seen before. In some cases, it's true. In some cases, it's not. This is very much the case. But some people said it about Doctor Strange uh, in The Multiverse of Madness. I disagree. I mean, yeah, the horror elements were nice to see. It was very much a Sam Raimi film. But a lot of it was... And I enjoyed it, but a lot of it was very formulaic. This was just completely different. It's a bunch of people on a hunting night and they uh, are in the same room as Man-Thing and a fucking werewolf. And as someone who's read the Werewolf by Night's comics... This nails it. Like, it is such a good adaptation. I, controversially, have been known to say that the MCU films, and and the the comic book films in general, kind of feel like a a rinse and repeat. And they can feel a little same-ish to me. This felt so different. Mm. This felt completely out of nowhere and I'd never seen that I've never read the comics so I wasn't really aware of what werewolf by night was but I thought it was so refreshing yeah to see something different the reference points were films that we love mm-hmm. the universal horror I for Harriet Sansom Harris 
who I fucking love. I thought she was fantastic. Yeah, she was. She, you might know her from Adam's Family Values, Monster in Law, Desperate Housewives, is what I remember her from. I thought she was really, really mm-hmm. great. One of those underrated character actresses. And, um, yeah, I just thought the whole package, it was a swift 50 minutes. Yeah. Didn't overstay its welcome. Yeah. You know, not every... And I think also, and I don't have MCU fatigue, but I think sometimes the MCU films feel the need to go to plus hours. Whereas this was just really refreshing. It's something you can watch every year for Halloween. Yeah. Pure Halloween. Yeah. Um, Black and white. Black and white. Uh, I just really, really enjoyed it. Really. It was just fun. I mean, sometimes you just want fun. Yeah. Like I said at the beginning... You know, 2022, been a little bit of a shitter in many areas. You just want a bit of fun. Yeah. yeah. Some, sometimes, not all the time, you just want a bit of fun. Yeah. And it's, it was just a really fun film. And one thing I really appreciated was the fact it did not rely on heavily on CGI. No. Like, And I was shocked because I thought Man-Thing was CGI. And then it came out after that, it was actually mostly practical effects. Um, and that is impressive, you know, and werewolf practical effects not cgi werewolf thankfully i suppose um, black and white helps with that yeah as well. and it was surprisingly gory like i, I don't know if it's because we're not used to seeing gore in the mcu but like there was something that i was like oh my god i really was not expecting that yeah but yeah really good and it doesn't take up too much of your time either no, it's so, just you know. a nice quick watch under an hour yeah. fantastic it's it's actually quite uh promising that horror is being introducing to the MCU especially means we have Blade coming up so it yes. feels like a good precursor yeah so Blade can actually be a horror film yeah yeah. like the others were horror films yeah I, I suppose the, ner- the the nervousness for Blade is that they make it too actiony yeah yeah and not in keeping with the horror roots so what's next up for you what know. number is it I can't remember <laughs> Well, Werewolf by Night was my number seven. Have you said your number seven? Did I call that Werewolf at Night? Did you? Oh, I may have. It's called Werewolf by Night. Werewolf by Night. What's your number seven? My number seven is... Scream! My number six is Scream, so... Very close together. My number six is Werewolf at Night. Oh, there we go. So, swapsies. Um, Yeah, (sighs) I had expectations for Scream. Obviously. Um... To we re- we had really enjoyed Ready or Not, hadn't we? Yes, and so we had high expectations. The the original cast were back, mm-hmm. thank God, because I wouldn't have given two shits if if we didn't have Courtney Cox, Nev Campbell, and um, former WCW champion David <laughs> Arquette in the cast. I I would be like, mm, I, I don't really care. Mm. And, and in all honesty, um, I I wouldn't have given two shits. But what we got was a really fun slasher film, really kept with what Scream, the original quadrilogy was. Yeah. The Wes Craven quadrilogy. It wasn't massively far removed from it, but still felt fresh. Yeah. And I really enjoyed it. It was a fun time. It had nostalgia because, you know, Scream... I'm a millennial, you know, Scream was the first big horror film that everyone talked about. That that was the one. Yeah. You know, that's... It, it, not really gateway horror, because it's a very bloody film. But that was... Before I watched any of the other classic films, I watched Scream. Mm-hmm. So it was so nice to see that on the big screen. You know, I hadn't seen Scream 4 in a cinema. No. So it was so great to go to the cinema and see a Scream film. Yeah. You know, maybe nostalgia's talking, but I really dug it. I thought yeah. it was fantastic. It's easily the best Scream sequel for me. And it's came at the perfect time too Ooh. with all the recalls. What? I don't know. I love Scream 2. But that again, that's nostalgia, isn't it's it? It's nostalgia. It's nostalgia talking. Um, but yeah, it, this came at the perfect time with all the recalls and everything because, you know, Scream always has something new to say whenever it comes about. And... This came about the perfect time, um, you know, there's very much a lot of this is, you know, throwing little digs at Halloween 2018 and such, which is great because obviously, you know, the first Scream, its main reference point was Halloween. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it works brilliantly. And oh my God, Jenna Ortega, 
seriously, just she's owned this year. Twenty twenty two is general. It's take, been her it? year, hasn't it? From the opening scene onwards, she fucking out of the out of the new cast. She really steals the show. Her and Jasmine Savoy Brown are two my two favorite new cast members. It's such a great new cast. Yeah, like everyone is so good. Uh, but yeah, General Tate just she's everything. She's again someone who's so different in every role she plays. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and the original cast members, everyone did such a good job. Um, Courtney Cox serving as per Nev Campbell, amazing. David Arquette was great. You know, it's just so good. It's it's what the uh, the franchise needed, and we even get Marlene Shelton back as Deputy Judy as well. Yes. And a reference to Eleven Squares. We of course. Of we all love Eleven Squares. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's the most easily the most brutal screen film. Yes. Like, yeah. it is so violent. And sometimes films can rely on that more than a good plot, but this has everything going for it. So it, it really is fantastic. Well, the screen films have always been quite violent. Yeah, really, this was, like, really, really violent. Apart though. from when they blew up the house in Scream 3. Well, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it is it is a fantastic sequel, and my number six. Yes, so we're on to number five. Top five. Top five. My number five is Hypochondriac. Nice, nice. Where it should be, but oh, don't you make me feel sad? That's not mine. I know. Top five. You should be ashamed. My number five might be your number four. Oh, it's got to be somewhere within your top four. If if not, I'd be very shocked. X. X. Of course. Is it your... No, number four. Number four, there X. we go. Um, yeah. X is basically, as we've already said, you know, the duo of X and Pearl is fantastic. And X is just really blew me away when I watched it because it is a throwback to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, zombie fleshy is eaten alive, motile hell, deranged, that sort of era of 70s horror. And... Again, the aesthetics are perfect, the cast is perfect, and it is just a fucking good time. It is. Again, you know, I, I know I keep saying it, but it was just a fun film to watch. Also, another A24 film in our list. So yeah. A24 have come out this year. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I mean, but also a meaningful film, which is it's strange to say about a, a porn crew uh, going to a bar where they're all murdered. But it yeah, has something to say about aging. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, yeah. there's some really meaningful moments here, and a lot something that a lot of people um, haven't really understood. Like I, I say this, not like the the people who I know who have enjoyed it, but you know, the people on like the Facebook groups that you see pop up, they don't really watch a lot of films, and they're like, uh, oh, I had to watch old people fucking, oh, old people this, old people that. Okay, fucking grow up. Um, Mia Goth, again, she's fantastic as Maxine, but she plays Pearl again here, but older Pearl and the prosthetics and so, and so on. I didn't realise it was Mia Goth until after we watched the film. Really? Yeah. She, again, absolutely knockout, stunning, stellar performances here in both roles. So fucking good. And the rest of the cast as well, fucking Kid Coody, General Ortega, Martin Henderson, Owen Campbell. All of them are so good. There's one character, though, who shows up to play Blanche Devereaux from the Golden Girls. <laughs> if she was a porn actress. If the Golden Girls was allowed swearing and an actual sex, <laughs> this is what Blanche would look like. It is. It is, of course, Brittany Snow as Bobby Lynn. Yeah, Britney Sp uh, Britney, S Britney Snow, Britney Snow uh, playing against type. I've only really seen her in. Oh, actually, I've only seen her in Hairspray. What? What else has Britney Snow been in? Uh, Prom Night remake. Oh, <laughs> oh no! Uh, yeah, I thought she was utterly fantastic. Um, she, I suppose, really had the comedy part. Yeah. Uh, a lot of her scenes were very funny and she did it so well. Um, really, really appreciated her character and her performance. And her performance of Landslide by Fleetwood Mac. Oh my god. <laughs> Is that a spoiler? No, no. It's when just a performance of the song. Halfway into the film, we get a scene <laughs> of Britney Snow singing Landslide 
to all the porn actors. <laughs> You know, that's high camp, it and is. I really appreciated that. It was a, a, just a, a fun time, just a fun film to just have a good time with. It, it's Yes, it's saying something if, if you want it to say something, but if you just want a popcorn flick, you know, a date night movie, mm-hmm. when you're looking to get lucky afterwards... Put on X, so good. Yeah, it's I very, really just enjoyed it. Very sex positive as well. You know, it's yeah. just it, it really is just everything it needs to be high. You know, high gore. The, mm. There's a lot of gore in this, and it doesn't actually turn into a horror film until you know, maybe even more than halfway through the film. Um, which you have to be a good film to nail that. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's just fantastic. And if you haven't seen it yet, what are you waiting for? Just really likable characters as well. I think that's very yeah. important. Yeah. In horror. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I cannot wait to see more of uh, Mia Goff's Maxine character. Yes. Oh my god, yeah. So. Is that a spoiler in itself? No, because the film's being made, it's been advertised. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you say your number five? It was Hypochondriac, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Four. Number four is. New Religion. Oh, is that higher for you? Yes. Um, how how much higher is it? It's my number two. Is it? Oh, okay. That's why we can talk about them. Um, so new religion. You know, I mean, we've said it a lot on this podcast episode. Take a shot every time you hear it. Rewind back. Take a shot every time. Out of nowhere, <laughs> completely out of nowhere. Completely. So, I mean, d- director of this film, right? He's. Um, <coughs> you're you okay now. You, you're dying. Still. I'm all right. I'm all right. That's, that's, we we all really appreciate you pulling through for the episode. <laughs> Director of this film, Kaishi Kondo. This guy just wanted to make a film. Yeah. First film. Yeah. You know, just completely out of nowhere. Submitted it to Fright Fest. He submitted a fucking masterpiece. It, I'm I'm not exaggerating when I'm saying yeah. that. Like, this is no. a fucking masterpiece. It's yeah. Beautiful, traumatic, enthralling, weird, absurd, emotional. It's so much mm. in one film and it works so well. Yeah. Let's let's be honest. Me and Gary, we love Asian cinema. Yeah. Love Asian cinema. And uh, not many Asian horror films managed to see this year unfortunately no no that is unfortunate but we didn't read there wasn't much on what the film was about no there wasn't this was the the world premiere at fright fest and we weren't able to get tickets were we no we had to pay extra so we were like yeah okay, with the fright fest pass, yeah, yeah with the fright fest pass a, you get a certain amount of seats allocated to your yeah. festival pass if you don't get those seats for free with the festival pass, you have to pay more to get them. And we paid extra for And this. we did, because we were like, okay, we we really love Asian cinema. We really want to support Asian cinema, you know, and we want to see more of these kind of films at festivals and, you know. And I think it's telling because we, we haven't got any other Asian films on That's our list, nice, huh? you know, str- struggling to, to find them at being released. Um, but we didn't have high expectations. We were like, oh, it's the first film. We don't really know much about it. And I was enthralled. Yeah. The guy next to me in the cinema wasn't so much, but I was. I was completely encapsulated. He he fell asleep, by the way. There was a few people <laughs> snoring. It's a very quiet film. It's kind of like yes. ASMR. Yes. Um, it's a, the sound design is very delicate. Um, but it makes it so... It, it's hypnotic yeah almost it is. it is and there are those horror elements there obviously but it it's a film that kind of you feel yeah and to be able to pull that off in your first film is astonishing very very talented director there the the point that i mean the, the fact that he, he pulled it off within his first film and the fact that excuse me shut up the fact that... Didn't see that scene. <laughs> the fact that he's made something that's not like anything else. And the fact the only... The closest comparison I can make is to Twin Peaks. Uh, the Return. 
that's an achievement. Yeah. Because I can't compare it to anything else. That's the closest. Uh, and even that's stretching it a bit. Like, this is like nothing else I've seen. No. No. It's surreal, um, but also in, in sort of enthralling. I keep saying yeah. that word, but yeah. like, that's the word I'm going to use. Yes. So, coming in at number three, oh. for me, is Nope. Nope. Yeah, you're on I three completely well. agree. Number yeah. three. Jordan Peele's back. He's done it again. He never misses. Um, uh, he's absolutely one of the best horror directors working today. We never, we rarely get UFO horror films these days. Um, clearly, if, if the same is going by, we need more of them. Because this is like Jaws, but with a UFO. Yeah, it is. It, it, it's a, a strange film. It's hard to describe. In terms of, is it a comedy? No, no, not really. Is it pure horror? No, not really. Is it sci-fi? Yeah, kind of. It, it kind of encapsulates many different genres. Mm -hmm. It wears many different hats, which doesn't always work. But I think in this, it, George and Peel is able to do that and do it really well. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I love the characters. More than anything else, I yeah. love the characters and I love the performances. And that's what really drew me into the film and drew me into mm -hmm. the, the plot. It's a bit weird at times, isn't it? Oh, yeah. The opening scene um, and, and when it co when it comes back to the opening scene later on in the film is, is probably one of the most disturbing things in any film this year. Mm. Um, it really is jarring and out of nowhere. Like... Uh, one of the UFO scenes as well made me really uncomfortable, really claustrophobic. And uh, yeah, Jordan Peele knows how to blend horror and comedy and drama perfectly. And, and now clearly sci-fi as well. You know, he, he's so good at mashing up genres and this is no exception. And of course, Daniel Kaluuya and Kiki Palmer oh, are both fantastic here. I loved Kiki Palmer in this film. Loved it. I don't just... Loved her performance. Yeah. Um, and I just... Jordan Peele is one of those filmmakers, and we're getting more of them now. One of those filmmakers that you know has a real love for cinema. Yeah. And a real love for films. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think Quentin Tarantino is sort of the embodiment of this. For, for right or wrong. He... You can tell that they love films and they take from films that they love and they piece it together and create something fresh out of it. It doesn't always yeah. work but they create something fresh out of it that doesn't feel too familiar. It, it's the product of their own sort of work but isn't scared. I feel like I sound like that Lady Gaga meme. <laughs> not afraid to reference or not reference. <laughs> Or whatever. But you know what I mean. Yeah. It's someone who really enjoys film. And so as two people who sit here who really enjoy films, I love it. Yeah. I love that kind of filmmaking. Where, uh -huh. people, where they're not afraid to sit down in an interview and say, yeah, I was influenced by yeah. the films I loved as a child. That's what I wanted to recreate. And but make it my own. Yeah. And it's layered too. Yeah. As well. You know, there's so many things that can be taken away from this film. Um, and... It, you know, and kind of subtle as well with its messages in this one. I feel like there's multiple things you could take from it. I mean, you know, get out, the messages stood through for the better, you know, they they, they always stood out. You knew what it was about. You knew what the messages were. The same goes for us, really, as well. But just, I feel like there's so many different things you could take away from it. And, and, you know, any film where you can translate it in different ways, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, I love a film that's open for um, discussion. Mm -hmm. The special effects were fantastic as well. The cinematography was fantastic. Um, and it has the best use of Corey Hart's sunglasses at night you'll ever hear. Apart from... The Wendy Williams. The Wendy Williams. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, really, really fantastic. And I assume, you know, if you listen to this, you've seen it. But if not, you it's a must watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really fantastic. I, I love Jordan Peele's work. Oh, coming into the top two. Oh, and number two. It's a new religion for you, isn't it? New religion for me. 
And for Gary... Wait, has X not made it into your top 20? We've discussed X, number four. Yeah. Oh, it was your number four? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow, okay. this has been a long episode. Are you all right? Number two for me is Pearl. Oh. So we only have one more left. But before we get to that, oh. it's time for our honourable mentions. I feel like Watch Mojo. It's a quick... Don't say that. People think we're ripping them off. Ah! Oh, yeah, because Watch Mojo were the first people to do a countdown. <laughs> quick fire round oh. of honourable mentions. Horror for me. Orphan First Kill. Terrifier 2, A Wounded Fawn, Something in the Dirt, Dead Stream, Follow Her, Smile, The Harbinger, Final Cut, Don't Judge Me, Halloween Ends, VHS 99, Speak No Evil, and Christmas, Bloody Christmas. Yes, I completely agree. Have you got any different? Nope. No. No. Nope. Honourable Mentions, Non-Horror, this is basically the rest of my top 20 of the year, um, but... You know, this is an episode dedicated to the 20 best horror films of the year. Yeah. Here are some of the best films of the year across all genres for me. Bros. Uh, refreshing to finally see a gay comedy mainstream that is, gets it right. Glass Onion. This could have been my biggest gasp of the year, actually. It's could have my biggest... Um, oh, my Christmas card. It could have been that. Because Knives Out wasn't the biggest fan. Glass Onion completely did everything so much better uh, and really just yeah fixed everything that I had an issue with in the first film The Batman one of the best superhero films of the year Wheel of Fortune and Fantasy more deep drama engaging deep drama from director of Drive My Car Fire of Love a knockout documentary that made Volcanoes interesting Flea Okay, this has always been interesting. <laughs> Flea, one of the best documentaries of the year. Again, fantastic gay story and representation. I Know Ho, one of the best animated films of the year. Benedetta, Paul Verhoeven back doing what he's doing best. Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, the best Marvel release of the year for me, easily. Licorice Pizza, a really great homage to Almost Famous and Dazed and Confused. <laughs> the, yeah. <laughs> Decision to Leave, uh, more Park chan Wook doing what he does best. Moonage Daydream, the best documentary of the year for me. Absolutely mind-blowing. Banshees of Inner Sheeran, fantastic. Uh, from Martin McDonough, again, back doing what he does best. I love best. all his films. Yeah. The Worst Person in the World, Feminist Cinema, I believe made by a man. Yes. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, that's honestly shocking. Fantastic. Triangle of Sadness. It's just phenomenal in every way. Aftersun. I'll give you a bit more about Aftersun. I have not stopped thinking about this film since we watched it. And it, genuinely, if the if my number one film of the year wasn't here, this would have been number one because this is... Oh, I love it so much. I, I really can't put into enough words how fucking good this film is. It's... Yeah, it's it's a film that sticks with you, and it's you have to be in the right frame of mind. I feel yeah, it, it 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 is a sad film. It is, but also strangely life affirming. Yeah, it's very very well made. Very well made, and my number one film of the year. It also happens to be my new number one favorite film of all time. It is the phenomenal. Flawless, groundbreaking, every every compliment under the sun deserves to go to this film. It's everything, ever all at once. Yeah, what a triumph yeah. this film is. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Just, I don't know. It's, it's difficult to really put down what makes it so great. Hilariously funny, mm -hmm. heartwarming, touching, sad, life-affirming. Yeah. You know, fan fucking tastic performances. I mean, if this isn't winning big at the Oscars, mm -hmm. oh well, who really cares about the Oscars at the end of the day? But it would be nice to well, see it. I mean, it's absolutely killed at every other fucking award ceremony. Yeah. So yeah, it's nice to see Michelle Yeoh getting all the attention she deserves. She deserves every award, really, because what a fantastic career yeah. and what a fantastic performance. Yes. Yeah. It, I feel like it is a result of her career. I think it's all been built into this. I feel like this is her big moment. Uh, and Kihu Kwan as well. From the fucking Goonies, you know. Just 
back and absolutely smashing it. Yeah. Hasn't acted in very, years. It's a very strange casting choice. I'm not going to lie. Very strange. Like, he has not acted so in well. years. And they asked him to be in the film. He said yes. And oh my God. Now he's being cast in so much other stuff. And he is the most adorable character in any fucking film ever. And he made me cry twice in one film. So, yeah. oh yeah. Just if you haven't seen it. It was released onto Amazon Prime without any sort of notice whatsoever, which is fucking bullshit. Um, yeah, watch it. Yes. Yes. Do you have any honourable mentions non-horror? Anything to say about the ones I've mentioned? Um, I, yeah, loved every film that you mentioned. Uh, particular favourite being uh, uh, The Banshees of Inishirin. Mm -hmm. Loved that film. Really, really enjoyed that film. Love Decision to Leave yeah. as well. I thought that was absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, I would only add to that um, Sick of Myself. Yeah. yeah, Which is a hilarious comedy. Absolutely. And uh, Parallel Mothers, which yes. I really, really yeah. enjoyed this year. Uh, Al Moldova is a genius as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. he, The camp, the melodrama... It's everything. I live for mm -hmm. it. I, I really do. I live. It's, it's very talent of this year in films that those didn't make it into my top 20 because, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. I'm <laughs> sorry. I no, fucking, it deserves a mention. I fucking love that it, film. It really does deserve a mention. Talk about life affirming. I really enjoyed that film. I, it just, yeah, wonderful. It's one that I will watch time and time again. I fucking love that film. Um, yeah, and then a little mention for Do Revenge. Do Revenge was great. Caught me off guard. Um, very much a throwback to the teen movies that I loved when I was younger. It's been a damn good year for films. Really. Yeah, it has. Damn good year. So that brings us to the moment you've all been waiting for. This is it. Our number one horror film of both, 2022. I believe we've both got the same we one. We both have the same one. This is Michelle Garza Caveras Who Sarah. Yeah. Just fantastic. It really just it's it's everything I want from horror now. This could have easily been generic. Let's face it. You know, a woman who's pregnant and she feels something's off. We yeah. could have had a baby bursting out of her stomach, we could have had CGI ghosts and you know, stuff we've seen time and time and time and time and time again. But no, this is one of the most refreshing horror films I've seen in years. Yeah, we, we could have gotten a, a Rosemary's Baby rip yeah. off, really. And it was nothing of the sort. It was very much told from the woman's perspective. Yeah. It wasn't afraid to be a horror film. Yeah. It was, you know, there was queer representation. Yeah. Um, there was punk representation yeah. I love you know it, it's had everything going for it it had heart it really got to you the scares were scary it wasn't just generic no. jump scares it, it none of it felt generic no it came from a, a, a real true perspective from a woman's perspective and it told the story of a, a, a woman a pregnant woman, remembering it was a horror film, yeah. but also layered, and yeah. you know, and being able to, um, sort of take what you wanted from the yeah. film, and I just, I really appreciated that. Yeah. It was just, it was everything, and I think, I think what really topped it off for me was the sea of white straight man films yeah that we've watched at horror festivals over the years and this year's been a good one for for representation but also not so great as well it's been yeah. a, it's been a strange one and again this is where gasp has come from mm -hmm. the idea that these films should exist and women should be making these films and they should be available for everybody mm -hmm. to watch yeah and I think that's maybe what's made it our number one film. Not yeah. it, it Obviously, what was on screen was fantastic. Five stars. 
but also what it represents for what we want yeah. from horror films. Mm-hmm. I think that's also why it's by far number one film, horror yeah. films for the year. Absolutely. There's a really interesting underlying theme of society's pressures of living in a heteronormative lifestyle. Yes. And how unhappy it can make a person when they just want to live life the way they want it without children and, you know, with their own choices, um, w- you know, without that voice in there at all times telling them this is how you should be living your life. And that is dealt with perfectly here. Like, yeah. it, it couldn't have been any better. Yeah, and we've we've said it time and time again. Horror is a perfect genre mm. to be able to talk about any issue. Yeah. It's a perfect, yeah. you know, more so than, you know, you wouldn't have a thriller that dealt with this necessarily. No. You certainly wouldn't have a comedy, um, particularly in 2022. Horror is a perfect genre yeah. to deal with a lot of these sort of themes of society yeah. and you know women's bodies and I think it's yeah no it's just really 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 well done and Myra Batala delivers such a fantastic lead performance this is her film and she fucking never lets us forget that yeah she, she is fantastic um, a lot of emotionally heavy scenes here and she just absolutely nails all of them she's just yeah really easy to become invested in um, it's actually now been picked up and is being released next year. Uh, well, this year, should I say, 2023. Uh, with the new title, Husera the Bone Woman. No, I'm a big fan of that. I feel like that the Bone Woman's been added on to get people interested, but it's, it'll always be just Husera to the me. The Bone Woman. I suppose Husera to a Western audience doesn't yeah, make... explaining what it means. Too much, yeah, too uh, much sense. But yes, the, the best horror film of 2022 for us, who said Yeah, right? Hopefully absolutely. it'll be everyone's favourite horror film of 2023. Fully recommend. That brings us to the awards round two. So these are our usual awards uh, section awards <laughs> from uh, from our usual episodes. And it only applies to the films within our top 20. Yes. So, biggest queen of the year, for me, it's Britney Snow in X <laughs> as Bobby Lynn. I agree, but I thought I'd go a little different. As, and I went uh, Katie Segal as Harper yeah. Dutch. No, that would have been my second, my second option. Biggest gasp of the Two year. Two country queens. Two country queens, yeah. Who, who sing. Yeah. Just do a duet. Biggest gasp of the year. It's not really a spoiler. It's been out now the whole year. It was a spoiler at the time, hence why it's my biggest gasp. But if if you haven't seen Scream 2022, just forward on like five minutes. It's the Billy Loomis Force Ghost in Scream. It's true. It's true. <laughs> I haven't get. There's been a lot of shocking things, you know, the twisting bodies, bodies, bodies. Some of the kills and X. Um, there's a few things that made me gasp this year. I don't think any of them made me gasp any harder than seeing Billy Loomis appear in Scream. <laughs> I completely agree. The, the whole thing. But it was, worked. Like, I mean, he's in the film. I was like, oh, okay, we're gonna get some sort of flashback of some sort. I didn't realise it was his ghost. <laughs> it works. It's so camp. It, it camp. really works. That is camp. Billy Luba's Force Ghost is camp. Is that your... Mm, absolutely, camp? yeah. Best dialogue of the year for me, it's Linda in the menu. Her only line of dialogue is a handsome boy. <laughs> my, my was, out of nowhere. <laughs> mine is uh, Wayne in X. We're going to be rich. Feel how hard my cock is. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, that's camp. I, this could have, it's been a camp year. This could have gone to many things, but because of how, how viral it's gone and everyone knows it now. And the fact that we know it's blatantly taken from Grey Gardens. The <laughs> ultimate camp moment in horror cinema 2022 for me is Pearl's iconic Audition. I completely agree. I'm a star. It's camp. It's camp. It's camp The it's... dance is perfection. She should have got a yes from the judges. She it's should have been taken on. Ridiculous. It's played to perfection. Her meltdown after. The, the meltdown after. 
the fact that this was the catalyst, <laughs> her thirteenth reason. This is her Joker origin this story. Is her Joker origin story. <laughs> All those memes, just yeah, excellent. So, high camp real. It's fine. Could have happened with a number of X Factor auditionees. It could have. You know, it could have. It reminded me of Zoe Alexander. <laughs> That's pink. That's pink. Uh, and yeah, that, ladies and gentlemen and days, ladies, days and gen- ladies, days and gays. Let's be realistic with our audience. Um, <laughs> that's our twenty best horror movies of twenty twenty two. That was. Let us know your favourites on social media. We're Horror Court Trash over on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Horror Court Trash on Twitter. I'm Dad at Gaz ninety two on Letterboxd. Gaz two at five on Instagram. Gaz Cruz ninety two on Twitter. I'm Chris Barker eight two three on Letterboxd and Instagram. <laughs> oh, so, so, <laughs> I won't be deathbed. No, I don't. Uh, and you know we mentioned it a few times throughout the episode, but again, you know if you are looking to come along to Gasp next year, tickets are going on sale very soon in February. We are Gasp Horror Festival on all social media. Go check us out. Yes. We have some very exciting submissions and we cannot wait to reveal this lineup. Some of them may be in the uh, Okay, years. okay. Oh, I thought you were going to give some away then. No. <laughs> in turn, I've gave some away. Great. Um, <laughs> Edit that out. <laughs> well, you know, got to keep people on their toes. Some of them right? may be on the 2023 list. Yes, then, then you never know. You know, we're trying to stay professional, but you never know. Um, yeah. We will be back. Oh, yeah. Give us a rate, review, subscribe on iTunes. How can I forget? You know, show us some love for all the the many episodes we've brought you in 2022. Give us a rate, review, subscribe on iTunes. Like and follow on everything else. This, tomorrow, if you're listening on Friday. Tomorrow. Saturday. Uh, on New Year's Eve itself, we'll be bringing you our Terror Train Original Versus Remake episode. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> perfect time, man. Perfect. Slight delay, but perfect time. For man. any David Copperfield fans out there, this is the one you've been looking forward yeah. to. And on Tuesday, we will be back with our first ever Japanuary episode. A theme will be running throughout the whole of January, discussing nothing but Japanese films. With a small exception, we do have a Friday the 13th. It's coming back. It's Ooh, been a while. Gracious. It's coming back. What's, the, what's that one? Six? Part six. Ooh. But on Tuesday, we'll be discussing one of the greatest films ever made. Kicking off the year in style with House. House. Yes. House. So looking forward to that. One of my favourite films of yes. all time. So we'll be back. Same time, same place. Tomorrow. <laughs> See you later. Bye.